The elephants don't realize that down at the river, the pride is feasting on a buffalo kill. The elephants become more distressed. Within minutes of crossing the border, Sam spots a familiar predator. But it's not one of the lions. It's a lone hyena mother and a young cub Sam seen before. She's named the cub Kadiki, local dialect for little thing. When they're tiny cubs, they are so, so cute, with dark fur and just these tiny little faces with big ears. They really, they really are something. The black fur indicates the cub's about two months old. Young hyena cubs only come out of their den when their mothers are present, so this is a rare treat for Sam. You see, it's a greedy little baby. He just keeps pushing up a mom's belly, trying to get more milk. Kadiki won't be weaned for another year or two. Soon her mother will take her to a communal den where she'll live with other cubs and babysitters. But for now, she's alone in the den she was born in and completely dependent on her mother. Unlike lions, where they have a group suckling and the females help each other look after the cubs, this is all the responsibility relies on this female. So when we see these hyenas trying to scavenge from the leopards and the lions, it's nice to just remind yourself that there's a reason that they're doing it. Obviously, they have to stay alive and they have to feed the, the cubs back at the den. Suckling is a huge demand on the mother's energy. To keep Kadiki fed, she's got to keep herself fed too. Every feeding trip she takes leaves the cub alone and vulnerable. hearing some alarm calling, it's solved with monkeys, and now we can hear the baboons alarm calling too. And often they're really good indicators that there's a predator nearby. Right on cue, a leopard appears. Barely 100 yards from the den, Luckily, for the little hyena cub, this skilled hunter is heading in the opposite direction. Borneo's jungles flood every year in the rainy season. So being able to navigate over water is a crucial skill. Orangutans aren't built to swim as their dense bodies sink rather than float. But crossing a rope bridge is a walk in the park for these arboreal apes. Even Kessie, with her missing hand, isn't phased by the obstacle course. She's become much braver since her arrival to Bungamut Island. but she still prefers eating alone. She can't sit in her usual spot under the platform here, so she improvises. As she munches away on her favorite turnips, something catches her attention. She moves in for a closer look. Oh, 
But there are no ropes to get her there. At first, she walks on submerged trees to keep her head above water. But then, she actually swims. This is very unusual. Drowning is a major cause of orangutan deaths. But orangutans who grow up in rehab appear to be more curious than those in the wild. Kessie's motivation for this risky choice is, of course, food. What she spied were termites. While Clover is away, I quickly install a small camera. And sure enough, I hear something very exciting. The sound of baby calls. Nobody has ever filmed inside a wild eastern quarrel den. I can't wait to discover how they develop over the coming months. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm eager to know how many joeys Clover has, but I'll have to wait. Each time she leaves the nest, she covers them to keep them warm and safe. Eastern quolls give birth to as many as 20 tiny young, not much bigger than a grain of rice. But only the fittest will survive the struggle to find their way to the six teats waiting inside her warm pouch. Up to six joeys will remain locked to their mother for two months. My guess is these youngsters are now about 10 weeks old. I come back to Clover's den many times in the coming weeks to watch her wild babies grow. At each visit, they appear more active, and once detached from the teats, they grow rapidly. What a privilege it is to see into their world, and how fortunate am I to have found this special place. Clownfish deal with the problem of overcrowding by sharing space with another creature, gigantic anemones. They've formed a relationship in which both parties benefit. Anemones have tentacles that are packed with stinging cells. Most fish, touching one, get a very nasty sting. But not the clownfish, thanks to the protective layer of mucus that covers its body. The clownfish keeps the anemone in good health by removing unwanted parasites. And in return, the anemone offers security. Its stinging cells ward off the sort of creatures which would otherwise threaten the clownfish. When the time comes for a pair to breed, that protection will be vital. A female may lay up to a thousand eggs on the rock beneath her anemone home. As she delicately attaches them, the male follows closely behind, fertilizing the eggs as he goes. A week will pass before the young are ready to emerge. Hatching only happens at night, so to record it, we have to use infrared cameras in a specialized filming environment. This is the very first time that this behavior has been filmed. 
With gentle encouragement from their father, the young are helped on their way. Once the little larvae are set free, they're on their own. They'll spend the first few weeks of their life developing in the open ocean. Jalema and her family have bumped into the Ensefu pride again. It's not third time lucky for the herd. They get more and more agitated, and it becomes a dangerous place for the lions. But they have no intention of moving on. The elephants don't realize that down at the river, the pride is feasting on a buffalo kill. The elephants become more distressed. had enough. Why she would approach a carcass in this way is hard to explain, but the message is clear. the lions to their kill. But there's no question who's boss around here. 